Professor Contreras, I'm going to ask you in a moment about your understanding of the risks um, and seriousness of different forms of hepatitis. But before we look at hepatitis B and then non-anon B hepatitis, you've described in your witness statement how as part of your teaching work, you would seek to educate students about the risks of blood by writing on the chalkboard the words blood can kill. Now, obviously that blood can kill not just because of transfusion transmitted infections, but for other reasons, but it can certainly kill because of transfusion transmitted infections. C can you give us an idea of, of when um, you would be providing your students with such a stark warning? Was that a feature of your, your teaching in the 1980s? Yes. Um, and what was it that you were trying to get your students to understand? That you have to balance the risks between transfusion and no, no, no transfusion, and between transfusion and alternatives. And that there are several risks in, in transfusion, and the worst one was errors. Uh, so I wanted them to understand that they had to think before transfusing. Um, now, if we turn to um, hepatitis B, first of all, as a transfusion transmitted infection, uh, in your witness statement, if we have that back on screen, please show me, WITN57, thank you, you're ahead of me. Um, go to page 72, please. You've, you've said in, um, under the heading hepatitis B that hepatitis B was something you were aware of, I think both as a, as a virus and in terms of its significance, its seriousness, from the 1960s onwards. Is that right? Mm, yes. And, and it was something which you understood could potentially be fatal? Yes. Um, now... We know that some form of screening of blood for hepatitis B was introduced in England and Wales in, in 1972. So by the time you started working at the North London Regional Transfusion Centre, there would have been testing for um, hepatitis B. What, what, can you recall what your understanding was of the sensitivity of those tests in, in the 70s and early 80s? Well, we later learned that they were not as sensitive. You know, the, the, initial, the initial tests were not as sensitive as time uh, evolved and, and we were getting better tests. So we realized that, that the sensitivity wasn't as good as it could have been, but that was a problem with the technology that we had, the techniques that we had at, at the time. And, and when you took over as deputy director in 1980, can you recall um, which type of test the centre was using at that point? Not, not exactly, but I think that it was either the uh, RIA, the radioimmunase, that, that had some risks because it used um, a radioisotope, iodine-1 to 5, or... We had, all, uh, we, we had already moved to reverse passive hemagglutination that was uh, safer for staff and, uh, uh, was, and then Dr. Barbara um, made, it even, uh, made it more sensitive by diluting the, uh, and, and using the uh, technology from, that was using hematology in microbiology and make it, make it, making it quite a sensitive uh, technique. So in, in terms of the, the, the changes in the testing techniques used, Dr. Barber may be the person who'll be able to assist in relation to that. He is an expert in that. Um, but it, would it be right to understand that um, there would have been an awareness in the centre amongst you and your colleagues that notwithstanding um, the fact that testing had been in... in, in in operation since the early 70s, there could still be cases of hepatitis B being transmitted through transfusion. Yes, yes. We learned that from Dr. Dane as well, that, um, and even now, perhaps there are a few cases. Um, and, and just so that those following understand, Dr. Dane was based where? 
at the Middlesex Hospital. And his area of expertise was? Hepatitis, and he was the discoverer of the um, surface antigen, of the Dane particles. Uh, yeah. um, now, if we then turn to non-A, non-B hepatitis, um, it, and if we, uh, if I ask you to go back in time, as it were, to say 1980, when you became deputy director at the, at the centre, is it right to understand that you'd have been aware by that point in time that there was something that was termed, for want of a better description, non-A, non-B hepatitis? Yes. And it was by then understood that um, um, uh, uh, some, perhaps most cases of post-transfusion hepatitis would be attributable to non-A, non-B hepatitis, whatever it was, rather than hepatitis B? Uh. Yes, but we had so few cases of post-transfusion hepatitis in, in, in those days that, uh, yeah, some of them were still attributed, attributed to hepatitis B and some to non-A, non-B. Um, now, in, in terms of your understanding of the potential seriousness of non-A, non-B hepatitis, You've described in your witness statement how your understanding changed over time, essentially through the course of the 1980s. I'm, I'm not going to go through everything you say in your statement, but you've drawn attention to, um, um, and you're not the first witness to have done so, to the publication of, of uh, Sheila Sherlock. Um, so if we could have, Shemek, WITN 402023. So this is a publication um, by uh, uh, Sheila Sherlock, Professor of Medicine at the Royal Free, Diseases of the Liver and Biliary System. This is the sixth edition, um, which uh, was published, uh, I think, in 1981. Um, and then if we go to the next page... I'm sorry, keep going. That just gives the date of publication. Yep, so we've got there page 257 of the textbook. Again, we've looked at this in, in earlier hearings with other witnesses, um, Professor Contreras. But we've got there the heading non-A, non-B hepatitis. Uh, we can see um, um, Professor Sherlock saying the elimination of hepatitis A and hepatitis B from transfused blood did not eliminate post-transfusion hepatitis. Some of the cases were due to cytomegala infection, but the majority were due to another virus or viruses termed non-A, non-B. This infection now accounts for about 75% of post-transfusion hepatitis, possibly 15 to 20% of sporadic hepatitis, depending on the geographic <coughs> location. Haemophiliacs receiving factor concentrates obtained from commercial sources are particularly at risk. Uh, Non-anal B hepatitis is largely blood spread. It had also been reported with drug abuse, renal transplant recipients in dialysis centres, and in donors used for plasmapheresis. So, this is a text because I understand it that you were familiar with at the time, so you, you, you'd have read and understood what was being set out here. Yes. And, and you've explained you, were, you, you, you knew Professor Sherlock in any event yeah. um, for, for a range of reasons. If we go over the page, there's then a heading clinical course. Um, the incubation period is about seven weeks, uh, although a short incubation type, one to four weeks, is also seen. The acute episode is usually mild and often anecdotic. Extrahepatic manifestations do not occur. Fulminant hepatitis is rare. The serum bilirubin and transaminase levels tend to be lower than with acute virus A or virus B infection. Uh, the serum immunoglobulin M is normal. The course may be prolonged with serum transaminase levels waxing and waning for many months. Mild chronic hepatitis develops in about a quarter. This usually improves with time. Circulating immune complexes may contribute. Cirrhosis can develop. Just ask you to bear that in mind. And then if we carry on, in liver biopsies, in addition to the general... If we can go to the next page. Features of acute virus hepatitis. The picture is of one of marked sinusoidal and portal zone cellular infiltration. Um, and then there's a description of other changes that can sometimes be seen. Non-A, non-B hepatitis often progresses to a mild chronic hepatitis. The prognosis of this is at the moment uncertain, but probably benign. 
Um, and, and you've drawn attention, I think, in your statement, Professor Concheris, to that, those last two sentences as, as representing, in part, your understanding that non-A, non-B hepatitis um, was not necessarily as serious as you later understood it to be. Is, is that right? Yeah. And, yes, and, and not as serious. And, and we didn't see that much of post-transfusion hepatitis because she was talking about the general problem of uh, uh, non-A, non-B transfusion And he, she includes in that uh, hemophilia patients. And I was, yeah, I was talking more of the transfusion of labile blood components. You know. um, now, th those last two sentences, the, the, the prognosis of this is at the moment uncertain and probably benign, as I read it, is talking about the mild chronic hepatitis that might develop. So um, it, um, the mild chronic hepatitis might be un un uncertain, prognosis uncertain, probably benign. Yeah. But reading the passage as a whole, you would also have understood that non-A, non-B hepatitis could lead to cirrhosis and had been observed to lead to changes in the liver. Is, is that fair? Yes, but this is in the acute phase. And then, then he said that the majority of them improved. So uh, the changes in the liver were, were in the acute phase and in, well, in, in the multiple, multiply transfused. You know, she didn't see, she, she, she was referred patients from all over the world, uh, Professor Sherlock. You know, you went to her clinic and it was the United Nations. Yeah. So she, she saw a selected uh, patient population. But yeah, I, I interpreted that as the acute phase and then they went to normal as, he, as she said it. Um, but you've also, in your statement, explained that, that you would have read a number of other publications um, at the time because you read various medical journals. Um, and you tell us you, you, you believe you would have read, um, there's an article by Purcell and Alter that you've referenced, and indeed the inquiry's looked at on a number of occasions in its hearings, uh, um, an article by, or by Dr. Krask in the mid-70s, um, and Dr. Preston's mm -hmm. 1978 a, a publication. So you, you think you would have read those at the time? Yes. I... Um, if we look at your statement, um, show me, can we have may, a may, may I, I just ask one question? Can we just go back to, to that passage? WITN 4032023, show me. The, the, last, the last paragraph, um, it, she isn't saying that non-A, non-B hepatitis normally resolves in its acute phase, is she? Because she said it often progresses to a chronic phase. Yes. Is one to understand from the word mild that at the stage that it becomes chronic, it, it may not show very much by way of symptoms? Yes. But one doesn't know, the next sentence is, one doesn't know what may happen after that. Yeah, but he, he says probably be benign as well. Yes. At the moment uncertain, but probably benign. I see. Thank you. Yes, I, I mean, so we've looked in earlier hearings at some of the other passages in the book, but they're not passages that, that um, uh, Professor Contreras has specifically referred to. I'm not proposing to ask her about the, the detail of them. Um, so if we then go to your uh, witness statement, page 75, please. Um, uh, so you've, you've described in the preceding uh, paragraphs in your statement the way in which subsequent editions of Professor Sherlock's book um, um, described non a non hepatitis in, in, in different terms. And then in paragraph 300, you say you're aware of publications which express contrary views, which you would almost certainly have read at the time, and then there are, you give three examples um, that the inquiry has, has previously examined. And then paragraph 301, you say this, I've reflected back on these publications. My interpretation today has not changed much from what I had when I first read these papers. They do not point to serious chronic effects of non-A, non-B hepatitis. Situation in the USA was different from the UK, 
as the incidence of transfusion transmitted infections has always been higher there. Now, just, just pausing there, if, if we leave aside the question of incidence and the, the fact that there are more cases reported in the States than the UK, which I, you may well be right about, but that's why would that be relevant to an understanding of the seriousness of non-A, non-B hepatitis? Uh, no, that, that wouldn't. The incidence would not. Yeah. And, and, and then you go on to talk about in, interpreting Dr. Preston's findings, the biopsy findings, which he described in that 1978 publication, as something particular to patients with haemophilia, i.e., if we go over the top of the page, something related to repetitive immunological assaults. The paper by John Crask also dealt with patients with, with, with haemophilia. Um, did, did you, therefore, in your own thinking at the time, and I appreciate I'm asking you to go back to a point in time at which your understanding was different from how, 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 how it is now, but... Did you therefore read these papers, do you think, as saying that the, 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 the changes reported uh, by Dr. Krask, Dr. Preston, were not viral in origin? Was, was that your understanding when you refer to it might be related to repetitive immunological assaults? Yeah, that might not have been viral in origin. And if they were, that they were so repetitive that the uh, that viral load was so high that it was different to somebody who was transfused with two or three units of blood. Do, do, do you recall whether um, that way of, of of looking at these 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 publications, these studies, was something that was discussed by you with colleagues, whether within the centre or, or externally? Were there Virologists or, or indeed haemophilia clinicians with whom th these these issues about non A non B were discussed at the time. Yes, I vaguely I, I vaguely remember discussing. I, I think it was with Eric Preston that I said, well, couldn't and in some of some of the papers that I, I, I read, there was this view that it could be an autoimmune disorder, uh, that it was different. And uh, yes, and I knew John Krask as well, but I cannot remember discussing very well whether, but there was some, there was a view that it could, that, hemo, that the haemophilia patients had more, uh, a greater Im immunological assault, regular immunological assault. So, what you described in your statement is you forming your own views and understanding of the, the significance of these different studies, your own understanding of seriousness of non-A, non-B hepatitis. Would it have been an issue upon which it would have been, at the very least, useful to have some form of central advice or steer or guidance, from whether from the chief medical officer or or through the regional transfusion director meetings or some other source, rather than you being left to reach your own, your own interpretation of, of, of what the medical literature was revealing? Yes. Yes, perhaps it would have been useful to have some uh, central ad advice of experts or uh, advice in the CMO. Uh, but my problem is that we were not seeing uh, the the problem that my haemophilia director colleagues were seeing. Um, uh, what you say, uh, just picking up upon that, uh, to some extent in paragraph 302 of your statement, you say, it's fair to say that my knowledge evolved over time with respect to the seriousness of this virus, because it takes a very long time for it to show its severe chronic effects in a proportion of infected subjects. Hence, I could not see at the time an obvious health problem in the population and did not do so until the effects of the virus began to manifest um, much um, later in time. Um, now, there might, this is going to be a very crude summary, Professor Contreras, but there might be two reasons why you're not seeing the effects of a virus. 
presenting itself. It might be because there aren't any serious effects, or it might be because it takes a very long time for those effects to show themselves, because this is a chronic condition um, um, where changes to the liver or, or, or symptoms might only become apparent many years after the event. D do you recall whether you gave active consideration at the time, either yourself or with others, to the possibility that the reason you weren't seeing this was because it was long-term rather than because it wasn't a serious issue? I can't remember... Yeah, because I didn't know that there, were, there was a long-term effect, so I couldn't have thought that there might be long-term effects because we were not, we were, all we could see was the reports from the hospitals that we encouraged the hospitals to report to us, and we would see a maximum of four cases of post-transfusion hepatitis due to the transfusion of products that we uh, provided, that means labile blood components. Yeah, but I, 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 I couldn't know that there were going to be chronic effects. Um, and then my, my next question is, is a general one rather than necessarily specifically limited to yeah. non-A, non-B hepatitis. Would you agree as a general proposition that it may be in the nature of of an infectious disease, that it can, it can take a period of time for the full implications of that condition to be clearly or, or comprehensively or conclusively understood. Would, would you agree with that? I fully agree with that. Yeah, that's in, in the nature of all diseases, yeah. And, and again, this is a very general question. It's not related specifically to any issue about testing or screening for non-A, non-B hepatitis. But, um, in, in, given that, if, if one waits for the full implications to be clearly or conclusively understood, it may be too late by then to take preventive action, as a, as a general idea. As a general, yes. Now, you, um, you told us that you, 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 you had a, a greater understanding about hepatitis B, and, uh, and obviously um, that had been something that had been identified since the 60s in particular. C can we just look at one of the articles that you referred to in your statement? Um, it's PRSC 40381. It's the Purcell um, Ulta Deinstag uh, um, article 1976, um, non-A, non-B hepatitis. Um, and if we could just go to page four. Um, it's a paragraph about halfway down the page, beginning, although type non-A, non-B hepatitis is associated with less severe acute illness than type B disease, as judged by frequency of jaundice and magnitude of SGPT elevations, the long-term prognosis for the two diseases may be similar. Um, and, and then um, there, there are various observations set out, and there's reference to um, patients undergoing liver biopsy. And then the last sentence of the uh, paragraph reads, thus chronic non-A, non-B hepatitis is not necessarily a benign infection and may be the cause of a significant proportion of chronic hepatitis not identifiable as, as type B disease. C can you recall whether late 70s, first half of the 80s, the extent to which um, um, uh, consideration was given to the possibility that non-A, non-B hepatitis might follow a similar pattern to hepatitis B as regards long-term effects of infection? I, I just can't recall what I thought in the 80s or 90s. But what, I, what impressed me with this paper is that at the end, they state that the only uh, means of preventing, perhaps that stuck in my mind, of preventing the transmission of this disease is to have all voluntary blood donors. Uh, um, you say, uh, if we go back to your statement then, Shame it, please, WITN 5711001, page 78.
Um, and it's just, just the first sentence of paragraph 315 at the bottom of the page. You say, with respect to non-A, non-B hepatitis, my knowledge developed over time. And in hindsight, my appreciation of the seriousness was perhaps later than others in the medical community. Uh, when you refer to being later than others in the medical community, w which, which others in the medical community did you have in mind? I, I don't mean by name, but in terms of what, what kind of clinicians are you identifying there who, who might have appreciated the seriousness earlier than you did? The, the liver disease specialists and the haemophilia uh, consultants or the, hemo the doctors who dealt with haemophilia. Um, and then... Uh, if we look in your statement at um, page 86, um, paragraph 339, you referred to your, that your view did change over time, gradual appreciation that non-A, non-B hepatitis infection could in fact lead to chronic liver disease. Um, and, there, and you talk about science and medicine being evolving subjects, and then you say, when the evidence was available, my view did change, but this took some time. I appreciate it's difficult looking back, Professor Contreras, but are you able to help us in understanding um, um, really the, 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 what you think the point in time was, the year was, um, when you would have... Um, realise that non-A, non-B hepatitis could indeed lead to chronic serious liver disease? No, I cannot. I would be speculating. Uh, um, I appreciate it's a difficult question. If we just go back to page 75 of your statement, paragraph 299, you point there to the eighth edition of Professor Sherlock's book, the 1989 edition, um, and you've... Um, uh, set out a, a summary of what was said there. You said there in the last sentence of that paragraph, I think this is really when I began to appreciate the true significance of non-A, non-B hepatitis. So is that, um, would that be your best estimate that it's probably around 1989? Yes. Um, now I want to come on to ask you now about the processes for donors to give blood and, and the, the donor screening processes at the North London Regional Transfusion Centre. Um, in, in, we can take the statement down, thank you, Shemi. Um, how would you decide roughly how much you needed to collect in terms of, of blood? How many donor sessions you might need to hold or how many, how many donations you might need to try and gather? Uh, well, with our team and our donor organizer. And it, we based it on historical data, as you saw with our business plan, uh, and also in consultation with the hospitals. We had very strong links with the hospitals. So, uh, and we had our predictions on how much we, we would need, but I wouldn't do it on my own. I would do it with my team of, of consultants and managers and uh, donor organizers. And, and is it right to understand that in terms of numbers of donations, you, by which I mean the centre, set its own targets? Yes, yes. Um, how common was it to have shortages? At, in, when I took office as a director, it was quite common. We even had a contract with Oxford, with the Oxford Transition Centre, uh, and I remembered that last night, I think, uh, that to import uh, blood on a regular basis was O positive, O negative, group O positive, group O negative, etc. And um, I don't, I don't remember having a contract with Scotland, but and we we had to um, get help from other centres. Because although we collected more than anybody else per thousand population, we still need our demand was greater than for any other centre. Um, and if you needed to try and increase the number of donations relatively quickly, um, you, you, you talked earlier about some of the strategies, the importance of treating your donors well. You had the donor association and so on. 
Um, were there particular strategies, um, as in quick fix strategies in terms of publicity or advertising that you might utilise? Yeah, we, we could, well, we didn't have much money for publicity, but we could, uh, we could telephone the donors. We, could t we had, you know, this donor association also helped us to telephone donors. And we uh, went to local radio and local newspapers that were always extremely helpful uh, in order to increase our supply if we were uh, short. Um, now, in terms of the staffing arrangements at donor sessions, um, we understand from looking at regional transfusion director minutes, meeting minutes, that in, I think it was 1984, the Brentwood Centre raised a question about whether nurses could, could, as it were, take the clinical lead at donor sessions rather than having a medical officer. Um, what was the position in relation to the North London Centre's donor sessions? Was there always a medical officer in attendance? Yes, before Jean Harrison's uh, brilliant idea to have nurses in teams, uh, we had medical officers going to every mobile collection team and to every static clinic. Okay. And, and you, you referred to Dr Harrison's idea as a brilliant one. Did, did that therefore change? Did, did yes. nurses become trained to... to to lead the sessions? Yes, as it's happened in the, in the health service, you had nurse co consultant nurses, and yeah, so yeah, it changed. Um, it, it, in terms of the, the, the kind of arrangements that were made for donor sessions, the inspection report that we looked at earlier might give us some specific details rather than asking you to call on your memory. Um, NHBT 306240, please show me. So you'll recall we looked at the first page of this inspection report earlier. Um, if we go to page four, bearing in mind this is 1989 and, and things may have changed, but we, we've got a description under the heading inspection, blood collection and receipt um, a, a, about um, the, the donor sessions. So it says blood collection takes place at 28 mobile sessions per week, including five using the special blood mobile truck. In addition to the static donor clinics at Deansbrook Road, Edgware, the West End Donor Centre in Margaret Street and in Luton, um, and then it refers to a, a mobile session taking place in a, um, in a particular factory. Um, so uh, throughout the 80s, is it right to understand that there were three mm. static donor clinics? Yeah, yeah. The, the Luton Clinic came into effect when I, when I was a director. Um, and so those were, were permanent clinics yes. um, where uh, members of the public could, would turn up to, to donate blood. Yeah. And then in terms of the mobile sessions, um, what kind of locations did they go to? Were they usually workplaces or would they also be community settings? Everywhere. Wherever we could find uh, a hall that was large enough and the will of the managers. We went to churches, we went to universities, we went to hospitals, uh, factories, um, and we had the blood mobile that we stationed. Uh, in, and at the, at, the two, at the three static clinics, we dealt mainly with plasma pheresis and platelet pheresis, but we also had walking donors. And, uh, panel donors. Um, and then um, I'll, I'll, I'll be coming on to, to records um, in a little while, but we can see from the second paragraph on the screen a reference to records. So although the introduction of a computerised system of donor records is plain, planned for later this year, the system currently in use is that of colour-coded cards. The record cards for all the donors on the appropriate panel are brought to each session. New donors are provided with buff-coloured cards. Um, and then it goes on to describe how a donor completes the medical checklist and consent form, and then a series of labels would be issued. The donor's name and blood group, I presume, is manually recorded. Um, a barcoded donation number labels are attached. The donor's given their record card and the remaining barcode labels, and then they proceed to go to an, another table where their haemoglobin is tested. Um, and then if you go to the top of the next page... Now, this obviously is the position as at 1989, so um, 
what's, what's next described is not something that would have been in operation um, earlier in the 80s. But it says at this stage, donors are given the opportunity of confidentially identifying themselves as members of high-risk groups for AIDS. This system is unique to NLBTC, involves the donor ticking yes or no on a questionnaire asking them if they belong to one or more of seven defined risk groups. The questionnaire is ticked in a polling booth type cubicle and is posted into a ballot box. One of the main advantages of this procedure is that a donor in a risk group, if he or she feels it's impossible not to donate, can identify the donation, which can subsequently be removed and not used to treat patients. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll look at the leaflets and questionnaires, as I say, um, in, in a while. But um, c can I just understand how this worked, at least by 1989? Um, uh, the, we, there's the questionnaire that's described here, which I think was introduced in 84 or 85 from recollection. Um, and, and there was a degree of privacy, is this right, to the way in which the donor could complete that? Total privacy. It, we, uh, if the premises had a little room, separate room, they would go into separate room. If not, we took screens so that they would be totally isolated. Nobody could look at them. And, uh, we, uh, and then they, they could complete it and put it in, in, in a ballot box. And, and would the expectation then be that that donor would simply quietly leave? Some of them would leave, and some of them, as one of the papers that you provided to me uh, states, some of them would tick the box and say, because they felt uh, pressurized by the workmates. For example, if lots of people from a building site came to donate and one of them had a, ri a risk factor, they wouldn't uh, not donate. So they would say, I don't want my blood to be used for uh, transfusion. I see. So they could still donate and therefore save face, as it yes, were. Yes, yeah, but, but the majority of the... the questionnaire would have had the barcode, one of the barcode labels affixed to it, so you yes. could identify that this was a donation where the donor had ticked yes, yes to being in a high-risk group, and so the donation could then, would then subsequently be removed. Um, and that's then, I think, the explanation for the last sentence of that paragraph. One of the main advantages of this procedure is that a donor in a risk group, if he or she feels it's impossible not to donate, can identify the donation which can subsequently be removed and not used to treat patients. Yes. Fine. And then the, the description that continues is the, the donors are then led to a bleed bed by a donor attendant, and then the, the donation is taken. Um, just while we're in this document, if we just go to page 12. This is about what subsequently happens. Uh, uh, the inspection report describes the various stages that are, that, that, that are undertaken. So this is about a later stage um, uh, when the products are ready for issue. Um, just picking it up in the second paragraph under the heading blood bank and issue. Um, I asked you earlier about, about the arrangements for supply of products to hospitals. This describes that orders for blood and products are either standing regular orders or telephone orders. When hospitals phone in an order, a clerk notes the request on a notepad, transcribes it onto a duplicate order form, the, and then a copy given to the issue department. So does that reflect what you referred to earlier, where you'd have, <coughs> you, you'd know that there, was, there were orders that were regularly being sent to Great Ormond Street or the Royal Free, but if they needed something more or something extra, they would phone in the, yes. the hospital blood bank and then it, the arrangement would be as described here. Yes. Um, can we then look at some of the documentation relating to donor screening? Can I just say yes. that this document, I, I just glanced at it, sees, uh, shows the difference that we had at different centres because we decided after having done some trials, that we would not use lignocaine at donor sessions, because uh, an anesthetic, a local anesthetic, because uh, it, it was better to just go into the vein and, uh, and donors preferred it. So that showed how different, different transfusion centers were. Um, 
So, Shabba, could, could we then go to PRSC 304358, please? Um, this is a document, um, Professor Concharis, that we, we, the, we in the inquiry looked at with Dr Napier um, on, on Tuesday of this week. So this is the 1977 memorandum on the selection, medical examination and care of blood donors. Um, and so this would, I think, be the, the guidance that was in force when you became deputy director in 1980. There, there were then various other versions of it in the course of the 1980s. Um, if we go to... Um, the page three, bottom of page three, we can see under the heading jaundice or hepatitis, this records that individuals who give a history of jaundice or hepatitis or in whose blood anti-HBSAG is present may be accepted as donors, providing that they've not suffered from jaundice or hepatitis in the previous 12 months have not been in house contact with hepatitis or received a transfusion of blood or blood products in the previous six months and provided that blood gives a negative reaction for the presence of HBSAG when tested by a sensitive method. Now, I'll, we'll come back to this issue in a few, few minutes, Professor Concheras, but was it your understanding when, when you became Deputy Director in 1980 that, that at the North London Centre, this was the practice? Yes. Um, that, uh, that if you'd had hepatitis or jaundice, um, in the last 12 months, you would be deferred would it, and you would be asked to come back at a later stage. But if you'd had hepatitis or jaundice two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, you could be accepted as a donor. Yes. Um, if we go over the page, please, there's a heading examination of the donor. And if we pick it up at paragraph two... It says the medical history should be coupled with a careful assessment of the donor's appearance. The experienced doctor can detect at a glance the potentially unsuitable donor. And then the, there are some examples given, poor physique, underweight, debilitated, undernourished, mentally unstable, those bearing the obvious stigmata of disease should not be bled. Um, would the arrangements at the North London Centre's donor sessions have in um, meant that there would be a doctor who should be an experienced doctor at every donor session? Yes. Um, how, how realistic was it that, to, to expect a doctor to be able to detect at a glance the potentially unsuitable donor? Well, we, we expected that the majority, well, all donors are voluntary donors, so they are all in good health, they feel uh, okay to donate, you know, and the majority of our donors are repeat donors as well. So, um, and you, you could only um, see at a glance the physical appearance and, of, of a donor, and some very occasionally donors were rejected because they were, well, the underweight, or if somebody looked as if they were going to faint or something like that, they, they would reject them as donors, but that was all that could. You, you cannot really uh, predict that somebody has a hidden disease. Not, not a GP could do it even after an examination. Yes, so, so for the most part, even the experienced doctor is not going to be able to look at a donor and know you've got hepatitis or you've, or not. Or you've, you've, be, you've got HIV. Yeah. Um, now, if we then just go to DHSC 0003734 underscore 066. Um, this is a later version of the memorandum, um, but I, um, can we go to page 11, please? because what it's got here are the forms that I think w were introduced with the 1977 memorandum. So this is form NBTS 110A. Um, and is it right to understand that um, at the North London Centre, this is a form that would have been given to all donors? Yes. And so uh, it says if it asks them to 
tell the clerk if they've recently been in contact with a case of infectious disease or had any inoculations or vaccinations. It identifies certain illnesses which mean that they cannot donate. And then it says, if you've had any of the following conditions, please declare this and a decision will be made in your individual case by the doctor. And then the list includes jaundice or hepatitis in the last year or contact with a case within six months. Now, w would it be right to understand that, um, therefore, the blood donor reading this would only need to declare jaundice or hepatitis if it had been in the last 12 months? Yes. So this form wouldn't pick up any older cases of jaundice or hepatitis? No, it wouldn't. And then if we go to the next page... Um, this is a slightly more indistinct form, but this is the form, um, uh, um, if we look halfway down, the, sorry, Jamie, could we actually go halfway down, if you keep it like that, you've got NBTS 110, and, and again, we'll see a reference in, in various communications that you have, Professor Contreras, to form NBTS 110. <coughs> um, uh, and then, it, as I understand it, if we look at the, the, the writing below this, there's a session date, uh, sorry, session location is completed a date, and it says to all pl blood donors, please sign below to show you've read the accompanying notice NBTS 110A. So the donor was required to sign this to show that they'd read the form that we've just looked at. Yes. Um, and that was, again, I, I think we'll, we'll come on to some of the the, the tweaks that were made by North London to the form, but this was essentially a standard form across all, all regional transfusion centres. Um, now, we, we, we can take that down. Um, we, we know, Professor Contreras, that the decision to readmit to the, to the donor panel, donors who had um, had jaundice or hepatitis um, longer ago than, than, the, than the last 12 months, was a decision made by regional transfusion directors, I think, in 1977 or thereabouts, um, uh, following the advice of an advisory group on testing uh, for hepatitis B surface antigen and its antibodies. Um, and so it's before you, you took up your role as deputy director. But do, do you recall having any concerns about that practice, that, that those with a history of jaundice or hepatitis could freely donate and didn't have to declare even that history? Uh, no, I didn't have any concerns uh, because at the time I thought, and there was evidence that the majority of uh, cases of, ja of jaundice or hepatitis uh, were due to hepatitis A. As is the case at present. Uh, um, if we look at DHSC 0002179 underscore 067, this is a 1976 publication, so again, it predates your appointment as Deputy Director in 1980, um, and it's from the International Society of Blood Transfusion. Uh, and um, th this part of the document is concerned with donor selection. If, if we go to page seven, if we just look at the top paragraph first of all. The non-remunerated blood donor is the essential element around which every blood transfusion service is shaped. None should join the select group whose blood may transmit disease to his fellows or whose health may suffer as a result of his generosity. Would it be right to understand that those two principles set out in that second paragraph were, were two of the, the guiding principles in relation to donor selection for the blood transfusion service? There shouldn't be harm to the donor and there shouldn't be harm to the recipient. Um, we then have a heading examination of the donor. I'm not going to ask you to go through that, but there are some sample donor selection forms over the page Now, these ask, if we look at point five, for example, we don't need to zoom in, show me if it's fine as it is. If we look at point five, have you ever had hepatitis, brackets, yellow jaundice? And then if we go to the next page, another sample form asks us the first question, have you ever suffered from jaundice? 
Um, and then if we go to page 12, this is uh, there's a heading viral hepatitis, which reads, in spite of recently developed tests for the detection of hepatitis B surface antigen, only a relatively small proportion of carriers can presently be detected. No routine screening test is presently available for the detection of hepatitis A virus or of other viral agents that cause transfusion-associated hepatitis. It follows, therefore, that some general precautions should be taken in an attempt to reduce the risk of such viral agents being transmitted from donor to recipient. Prospective donors should be excluded if it is known that they, and then there are a number of, of um, exclusions set out here and on the next page, but it's the first one, give a history of viral hepatitis at any time except during the first months of life. This rule may not be acceptable in all countries and may have to be modified where viral hepatitis is endemic. So the advice of the International Society of Blood Transfusion in 1976 um, was... Um, if you have a history of viral hepatitis at any time, you should be excluded. Do, 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 do you recall, first of all, whether you were ever aware of this particular advice? I must have been, because I've joined the, the ISBT. Long, but many, many of these documents from the ISBT and the WHO are mostly directed to those countries that do not have guidelines and while you don't know anything about the population or the donor population where most of the uh, donations are replacement donors or paid donors. You know, I was a president of the ISBT, so I remember doing uh, writing, not myself, but signing to guidelines uh, from or, or the WHO. So it's very different. I'm Chilean, you know, it's very different when you have a history of uh, hepatitis in a country where the majority of donors are not voluntary donors, and where um, if, even if you, a history of jaundice could have been a hepatitis B, a carrier of hepatitis B, but the systems in place were not good enough. And uh, may, lots of times in the developing world, you just couldn't test properly, or you didn't have kits. So you have to have a belt and braces approach. And this was, international, so it had to be for African countries, South American countries, Asian countries as well. Uh, it wasn't really meant uh, for countries like the UK. I mean, it, it doesn't say that, does it? Because no, it doesn't not, say. I mean, and you referred to the World Health Organization report, which I, yeah. I'm sure you were familiar with, but was provided to you, I think, in advance of your evidence from 1952, which also records the same basic principle that if you have a history of hepatitis, viral hepatitis, should exclude you for all time. Um, there's, there's nothing in those documents which say this own... I mean, it obviously says not acceptable in all countries, but there's nothing in those documents which says this is, a, this is advice or a principle limited to um, developing countries or countries where there isn't a voluntary system. No, it doesn't. <coughs> but... May I, um, may I say that, um, first of all, the, the tests were uh, not good enough, and we, there was no evidence for, for that statement, either in ISBT or WHO. Uh, there, there was nothing to, to say that donors with a history of jaundice had, uh, were uh, more we're transmitting more hepatitis by transfusion. If we just then move from 1976 and the International Society of Blood Transfusion um, to the Council of Europe's Committee of Ministers in 1983. So that's NHBT 0010651 underscore 004. So this is concerned with member states of the Council of Europe. It's, it's not concerned with the, with the world platform. Um, and the specific recommendation here is, is directed at, at AIDS. If we go over the page, um, you'll see the recommendation at the top of the page, point one, is to take steps uh, which include 
um, and it, and this is the fourth paragraph down, to provide all blood donors with information on AIDS so that those in risk groups will refrain from donating. An example of an information leaflet for donors is appended. Now, we'll look at the, 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 the AIDS leaflets used in England and Wales shortly. But if we then go down the page, we can see the sample information unit the, the passage in italics under the heading appendix says the present information leaflet for donors has been prepared and is used by the American Red Cross. It's given as an example for the convenience of National Blood Transfusion Services wishing to draw up their own information leaflet. The rest of that page deals specifically with the issue of AIDS. But if we go to the top of the next page, this American Red Cross leaflet um, appended to the Council of Europe's recommendation under the heading hepatitis again envisages the permanent deferral of persons with a past history of viral hepatitis. Um, do you recall whether, well, first of all, do you recall whether you ever saw this recommendation in, in or around 1983? I, I couldn't say whether I saw it or not. So I, I think it will probably follow from that that you can't recall whether this led to any discussion within no. the blood transfusion service as to as to whether the the practice of allowing people with a history of viral hepatitis with a history of viral hepatitis to donate should be reviewed no. but what what i knew what i what i remember is that we never took that the blood service never took uh, those decisions on their own it must have been on the advice of specialists uh, in uh, in hepatitis or in... It, it is certainly right to say that the, as I understand it, the decision of regional transfusion directors to um, allow those with a history of viral hepatitis in 1977 to start donating uh, reflected advice given by the advisory group on, on um, testing for hepatitis B surface antigen. Um, can, can we then just, looking at... Uh, later versions of the guidance for the selection, medical examination and care of blood donors, look at one that was adapted by the North London Centre. So this is NHBT 0057118. Um, so it's headed North London Blood Transfusion Centre Guidance for the Selection, Medical Examination, Care of Blood Donors, compiled 1985, revised April 1987. I'm not going to go through it in, um, in, in any particular detail, but it, it looks from this as though the North London Centre took the, the, the national guidance that had been agreed between regional transfusion centres and then uh, um, made some of its own changes or amendments or additions to it. It, it, is that right? And if so, could, can you recall... Um, Vaguely. Yeah. Um, and d d can you recall what it was that led the centre to want to produce its own version? I, I think that one of the issues was that they want... The, the guide, the national guidelines, wanted the donors to sign that they were not in a high-risk group of transmitting an infectious agent. And, you know, nobody in this room could know whether we're, we're in, a, in, a high, in, a, in a risk group of transmitting some infectious agent. So I think that that was the main point, but I cannot remember very clearly. Um, just on that point, you've made um, Professor Contreras I think there's some correspondence between you and Dr Gunson that may deal with that issue NHBT 0009866 um this is a letter you wrote 28th of December 1989 to Dr. Gunson, and it refers to the form NBTS 110, so that the standard form that we looked at um, a few minutes ago. You say in the second paragraph, at, at the North London BTC, we hold a considerable proportion of donor sessions in industry, and we do not send any correspondence to such donors. They're reminded by the local organisers of our visits and are asked to attend. 
in addition, 10 to 20% of our donors are first-time donors, and a significant number of known donors change their donation venues without giving any notice. People in London move house and work quite regularly. These are the three main reasons for donors arriving at a session without having had the opportunity of reading the AIDS leaflet. We would need to have a member of staff acting as a receptionist at all donor sessions, ensuring that all donors read the leaflet before they're asked to sign form uh, 110. And then, if we go over the page, we've discussed NBTS 110 at length with the consultants at this centre. We'd all oppose number five in your revised form. I'm afraid we don't have the attachments to match to that. Uh, we do not think that we can ask anybody to sign confirming that they are not at risk. Now, j just so that I can understand what you were saying here, Professor Contreras, properly, you did ask donors to identify whether they were in specific risk groups. Is that yeah. right? So it might be, are you, are you homosexual? Um, uh, in the course of the 80s, there were questions about whether someone had been in certain parts of the world. Um, indeed, I think that was a feature of forms at various different stages. Um, intravenous drug use, sexual contacts of people who were in, in, in such groups. You'd ask those questions, is that yes. right? So is it right to understand the question that you were objecting to was a question which asked donors to confirm that, as a, that they were not at risk of... Of transmitting some, uh, uh, an agent transmissible by blood. Um, you know, uh, because uh, y those, those were the main uh, risk group categories, the ones that we said. But if you are the wife of a bisexual man, as we saw, uh, as we evidenced when we questioned, when we counseled our, our donors, uh, you, you have no idea that you are uh, in a risk group. So a number of uh, donors who come very willingly to donate do not know that uh, their partner might have been a drug addict or might have been at risk of HIV transmission. So we could not ask donors to, to sign, I'm not at risk of transmitting anything. And, and I think just to complete the, the correspondence, um, Dr. Gunson wrote to you in February 1990, at NHBT 5077 underscore 065. Twenty sixth of February, um, dear Marcella, Roger, that would have been Roger Moore. Yes. yes. Has shown me your letter advising him that you do not propose to use the revised form MBTS one one zero and instead you'll be using your own version. And then third paragraph, Dr. Gunson says, I don't have the authority to demand that you use a particular form for your donors to sign. All I ask is that you think very carefully about the action you take in this regard. And he makes the point that this is a form that's been agreed by the majority of regional transfusion centres. You wrote back in March at NHBT 40189 underscore 079. Um, in the second sentence, second paragraph, I'm most grateful for your concern regarding my lack of full compliance with MBTS 110. I understand your reasons for writing to me. However, I agree with all the contents of the form except for the sentence stating that donors confirm that they are not at risk of HIV infection. I know that you and most of our colleagues see this confirmation within the context of the AIDS leaflet. I've discussed the matter at length with my consultant colleagues at the centre. We all agree we cannot ask prospective donors to confirm that they're not at risk. The proof of this lies in some of our recently confirmed HIV seropositives who genuinely did not think they were at risk. So is it right to understand, therefore, that, that you used at the centre then a modified form NBTS 110 um, at this point in time, which did not include the question or the request to confirm that the person was not at risk of HIV infection because you thought it would be problematic for people to be able to answer that question? No, because people didn't know. There, there was a, a, a proportion of the population who didn't know that they were uh, at risk of transmission. And also, um, you, 
you can transmit other agents that we were not testing for. Uh, we genuinely thought that if a donor signed, I'm not at risk, and then they were found to be positive for HIV, particularly for HIV, but or hepatitis B. You know that, uh, and they had no idea that they were carrying those agents. Uh, why? No, nobody knows what they're carrying, really, in in their blood. But say that there's no misunderstanding. Your donors were expected to identify if they were in specific defined at-risk groups. Oh yes, they signed their self. We were the only ones who had the self-exclusive questionnaire. So, yeah, for the, if they were in at risk groups, they self-excluded them, but themselves. But this was a, a too general uh, statement. Um, and, and would it be right to understand from, from what you've described in the correspondence we've looked at that although there was um, an expectation that regional transfusion centres would use the same form across um, all centres. Um, as the correspondence indicates, if an individual regional transfusion centre wanted to do their own thing, you, you could. Dr Gunson could ask you not to, but he had no means of compelling you to, to do something different. Is that right? Yes. Uh, um, can we then go back to your statement, WITN 5711001? Um, if we look at paragraph 173, page 45, please. About 172 and 173. So um, this, this was in the context of record keeping, um, which we'll look at after lunch. But you, um, you say there you thought that the, the measures were adequate to prevent, very adequate to prevent donors suspected of carrying bloodborne infections from continuing to give blood. Donors who were suspected of carrying infections were personally approached and counselled by a doctor, etc., etc. Et um, now, if we leave aside um, infections that are identified through testing, um, how often was it that a donor would be suspected in the absence of a test of carrying an infection and, mm -hmm. and excluded from donation? whether on the basis of, of an, uh, the doctor's assessment or um, signs such as weight loss or other problems in relation to health? Was it, was it common for donors to be excluded on that basis? No, it was very uncommon. The majority, as I said, the majority of the people who come to donate are, are very healthy and, and they're very well informed. Um, Can I then ask you about specific categories of, of, of donors who might be regarded as being at, at, at higher risk than others? Um, we can take the statement down, thank you, Shemek. Intravenous drug users. What, what means were there of um, trying to ensure that patients with, or donors with, a, with any type of history of intravenous drug use did not give blood? The self-exclusion questionnaire, you know, the, uh, and all our leaflets that stated that. But still, we still found that some, uh, some of our publications show that they, they had forgotten they had, that they had used drugs intravenously. So it was, you know, we were asking them to state whether they had been, they, they had, were intravenous drug uses, but uh, a number of them had, would have forgotten. So you were reliant upon donors, not just truthfully, but also reliably yeah. recalling that they um, ought to be answering in a particular way. Um, d were questions about intravenous drug use asked before AIDS and the AIDS leaflet in 1983? So was that always a feature from the time you were there at 1980 of the I cannot, I cannot remember. Uh. Um, military donors, if we can just come on to that as a category, um, and um, in particular US 
um, military donors. Um, if we just start, first of all, um, with NHBT 0002981. This is a letter 1990 to, Dr. Uh, to Roger Moore, um, the National Director. This is from um, Dr. Hewitt. Um, but she records in a second sentence, we do collect a large number of donations from MOD establishments. So that would be British military establishments, presumably. Um, again, had that always been a feature throughout the, the time you were there of, of the donor sessions that you went to yeah. m military bases? Yes. Um, um, and then if we look at uh, NHBT 0004776, Um, this is a letter, um, it, it's again from Dr. Hewitt to Dr. Gumpson, it's July 1992, headed donor sessions in US military establishments. It says, for many years until 1986, we held regular blood donor sessions at a US military establishment in Bedfordshire. This was the only US establishment served by NLBTC, but the donor session also served a number of UK civilian personnel. Um, just pausing there. Do you recall whether there was ever any thinking about whether military personnel, British or American, um, whichever, um, should be regarded as being a higher risk, um, or, or should be regarded as a high risk group? Was that ever part of the centre's thinking? No. Um, do you, was there ever any positive consideration given to it at all? In other words, did the centre satisfy itself that military donors should not be regarded as high risk? Uh, yeah, what, the only thing I, I remember, I recall, is that what we discussed was that we did not want the uh, military personnel lined up by the boss or by the captain or head uh, to give blood, that it, we wanted it to be a fully voluntary act. Uh, so that, that was the only risk that could have been there that uh, their boss might have told them, you have to go and give blood. And we don't want any donors under pressure. But the, there might, might there have been particular difficulties for um, a military donor in, um, uh, in a identifying themselves as ineligible because uh, of, of being gay or because of intravenous drug use. And I think as, as this and some other documents show, um, you couldn't be um, in uh, uh, the, a, a US military role and be gay. It was unlawful. Yeah. Was consideration ever given to the, the, to the fact that there might well be a pressure on donors not to answer truthfully? Because if they did, they would be thrown out of the military. Yes, uh, but we we learned that uh, later on, when when we had our first HIV positive, then we started thinking about it that you know they would have yeah that they couldn't say that. But we had the self exclusion questionnaire as well, and that even that was bypassed by, by some donors. Um, I, I won't go to the re remainder of the documents on this issue, but I'll just give a couple of references for the transcript. So the second page of this letter actually appears under a different reference. We don't need to put these up, Shemek, um, which is NHBT 0004777. Um, and the letter discusses an issue which arose in 1986 about whether HIV results would have to be reported to the US authority, military authorities. Um, and that was discussed at a regional transfusion directors meeting in January 1986, the reference for which is NHBT 0018200. Um, the, the third category I just wanted to ask you about before um, we break, because I know the time, um, was prison donations. Um, if we just look at JPAC 602 underscore 039. 
This is a letter from Dr. Barbara to Dr. Bird, a haematologist at the Churchill Hospital in Oxford, August 1994. And if we look at the third paragraph, it says this. Certainly prior to the introduction of HBSAG screening of donors in 1971, the prison population represented an attractive source of donors, a truly captive audience. But in North London, we noted HBSAG detection rates up to tenfold higher in donor sessions at prisons compared with rates elsewhere. At the time, we thought this might be due to increased levels of homosexuality. However, in the light of HCV epidemiology, a considerable proportion of the HBV infections may have been drug associated. And then skipping over a sentence, certainly the difference in rates was sufficiently obvious to prompt the cessation of blood collection from prisoners in North London in 1973. And if we go over the page, this is one of the documents that Dr. Barbara referred to, HBSAG prevalence in prisons, brothels, etc. Um, and we can see there the figures, um, first of all, for 1971, HBSAG rate in donors overall, one in 1,745. Rate in prison slash brothels, one in 92, i.e. 19 times higher. And then for the first half of 1972, the rate um, in the overall population, one in 1,946. And then in prisons, brothels, one in 339, i.e. 5.7 times higher. It, it's, is it right to understand, D D Professor Contreras, that um, when you arrived at the North London Centre as, as, in your post as Deputy Director, the centre did not collect from prisons or brothels? Yes, and we, that we did, did not. And that didn't change? It did never, it never changed. And just one last document, um, if we may, MDIA 602. Th this is an, uh, a, a, a press article, um, a blood transfusion service, sorry, he headline, hepatitis risk in prisoners' blood. A blood transfusion service is refusing to accept blood from prisons. Dr. Thomas Cleghorn, director of the North London Blood Transfusion Centre, was he the predecessor to Dr. Davis? Yes. yes. Said last night that the risk of hepatitis was considerably higher in the blood of prisoners than it was in blood from donors outside. He criticised the crowding and standards of sanitation in prisoners. Dr. Cleghorn said that in a closed community such as a prison, there was a good chance of hepatitis being incubated, not being detected by tests. If infected blood was transfused, the consequences could be serious and could result in death for the patient. The centre used to take blood from prisoners in Wormwood Scrubs and Pentaville, but stopped the practice about a year ago. <coughs> Dr. Cleddon said last night that about 800 prisoners have been blood donors. He was concerned, he said, about the safety of the blood he was passing on and not about prisoners' rehabilitation. Um, we know from other evidence, Professor Contreras, that other centres continued to collect blood from prisons into the, during the 70s and into the 80s, with some not stopping until, <coughs> excuse me, late 1984, possibly 1985. Do, were you aware of that? Yes, in, in a way I was, yeah. Do, do you recall whether um, regional transfusion directors were, were troubled by that? Was, was any step taken to try and persuade other centres um, to take a different course, either by you or by others? No, because I, I wasn't... That was never discussed at an RTD meeting that I remember. Uh, and, um, and because the decision had been taken before my time, um, I, I didn't... I perhaps knew something that they were collecting blood from from prison from prisons but no, i can't i can't remember and, and it's right to say you only became a, a director in february 1984 so yeah. you wouldn't have been attending the rtd meetings prior to yeah. that in any event um sir i've, I've um, gone past one o'clock for which i apologize perhaps we could take our lunch break now uh yes yeah, so we'll take a take a break we'll we'll give um everyone the full hour shall we uh, and come back at five past two so five past two, if you please.